hello, Blogging Heads Nation, back for another round. Uh, today, it's Heather Herbert from the National Security Network, and my new uh, victim slash guest is Chris Preble from the Cato Institute. And um, before all you loyal progressives turn away, I have to say, uh, if disagreeing with somebody makes you smarter, um, you're going to be incredibly smart by the time you finish this. Chris is one of the people I've been most nervous to be on this with, because every time I disagree with him, I learn something. So... Um, here we go. Uh, we thought we would do today as a little roundup of the foreign policy debate at the end of the week, but Chris, maybe I should um, let you introduce yourself to the to the fans, um, tell them a little about yourself and your very interesting background before you ended up at the Foaming at the Mouth Libertarians. Sure. Uh, well, I've always been a Foaming at the Mouth Libertarian since uh, college, at least. Uh, in fact, I started my career in public policy as an intern at the Cato Institute my sophomore year in college. But uh, after I graduated from college, I served in the U.S. Navy. I was an ROTC and uh, served in the Navy for four years and then went to graduate school in uh, Philadelphia at Temple. I've been at Cato now for five years, and I'm the Director of Foreign Policy Studies. Uh, most of the work that I've done um, has related to Iraq and U.S. foreign policy uh, as it relates to Iraq and after Iraq, but also other issues related to that. I've done some work on U.S.-Japan relations, and some, uh, and I've just finished a book on uh, U.S. foreign policy called The Power Problem, which will be out uh, next year, spring of next so year. So I have to ask, what made you turn into a libertarian in college? Well, you know, I, I, I figured out pretty quickly that I was neither a liberal nor a conservative, and it did take me a few weeks to figure out if I was neither of those things what I was, because I knew I wasn't a moderate. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, that will come through clearly enough, I suspect. Um, but, you know, I believe in a limited government on, on both, uh, in both the economic and the personal realm, and I think that's really what differentiates libertarians from both liberals and conservatives. Liberals, of course, uh, believe in limited government with respect to personal privacy and, and personal issues, but believe in an active government with respect to the economy. Economists, uh, conservatives believe essentially the opposite, which is that we should have a very active government with respect to personal issues and, and cultural issues, but uh, more laissez-faire with respect to the economy, although I should point out that conservatives, at least conservatism as practiced by George Bush, has not been exactly uh, committed to, to limited government. We've had one of the uh, largest expansions of government spending under George Bush and the Republican Congress uh, in, in recent history. So uh, libertarians would like to believe that we are the consistent ones who believe in limited government all the time, not just when it suits us. Well, the, one of the things that tells me just how much Washington has changed over the last eight years is that the first time I worked with Cato was in 2001-2002 uh, when I was ranging debates between my boss at the International Crisis Group, where I worked at the time, and senior right. people at Cato. And um, today, I have to say, I don't agree with you on everything, but um, rather than arranging debates with folks at Cato, I'm far more likely to spend my time making common cause with people at Cato <laughs> against neoconservatism run, run right. riot. Right. Well, I think, I think what we've seen over the last uh, six or eight years, and, and even a little bit before then, was that there, is, there, are some common, uh, there are some common interests between the neoconservatives and some people who call themselves liberal, liberal internationalists or um, uh, some progressives even uh, with respect to an activist government advancing a moral foreign policy as opposed to a foreign policy dedicated to advancing U.S. national security, which is my, my vision of, of foreign policy. And then so, I mean, we saw some of the evidence of that in the late Clinton years, even when the, you know, the editors of the Weekly Standard were busy uh, advocating the impeachment of, of Bill Clinton, they were generally supportive of the intervention in Kosovo. Uh, if anything, they would have liked a, a more aggressive use of force uh, there, including ground troops. And I think that was a kind of early portent of a, uh, a coalition of interests between neoconservatives and liberal internationalists that we saw into the Iraq war, where, of course, many liberals did support the war in Iraq, uh, not just on national security grounds, but also on uh, moral grounds, very similar to those the, the case made for intervention in, in the Balkans in the 1990s. I was thinking about this in, in preparing for our, our talk, and as a, as a liberal who did not support the war in Iraq, I sort of label myself as a progressive pragmatist, which I think is mm -hmm. where you and I meet on the pragmatic piece. I do, right. think, I do think there has to be a moral piece to U.S. foreign policy, um, and that it often, when it's done right, it actually reinforces the national security piece, and that, that they most of the time shouldn't be viewed as um, opposite poles. But um, I'm also in favor of, of having um, what one of my bosses used to refer to as a reality-based foreign policy, mm -hmm. and I think, yes. I think that's where, where um, at least your strain of uh, libertarianism and I, at least in the current environment, find, find common ground on a lot of things. 
Right. I mean, I think that, that if you think about libertarianism and it's kind of its general skepticism of the ability of government to do good things uh, as in, in a general sense, then there is some consistency with a skepticism about the ability of government to do good things abroad. Uh, and that's where I Well, then in. I can't and resist asking you a question about that, because certainly if you look at, if you look at opinion polling, the skepticism of Americans about, um, about the efficacy of their government to do much of anything has never been higher. Um, mm-hmm. You look at the Ron Paul phenomenon, this cycle, and right. so you, you have to ask, are we all libertarians now? <laughs> I think that there there is certainly a group of American voters, even if they don't all define themselves as libertarian, who are generally sympathetic to the idea of a small government at home and uh, and a small government abroad. That is a government that is more uh, focused on advancing U.S. national security and less on uh, the more kind of grandiose uh, goals of the Bush administration and even to a lesser extent the Clinton administration before them. Um, the challenge, of course, is that we have a two-party system, a dominant two-party system here in this country, and so it is difficult, as we saw with Congressman Paul, it is difficult to break into those two you know, dominant parties uh, with, a, with a point of view that is not uh, seen as the mainstream in either of those two parties. Um, you know, I'd like to see uh, a, a, a good showing by some third-party candidates this year, uh, and I think that's a possibility, but at the end of the day, we, we are kind of, you know, Stuck with this two-party system, and the two parties have been very, have proved very adept at uh, you know limiting competition uh, to to prevent uh, the, you know the emergence of a of a genuine alternative. So here's a question: If Ron Paul were on the stage on Friday night at the um, foreign policy debate, what would he be talking about that uh, McCain and Obama won't be talking about? Well, I think that in, in, if you look at his statements and and during the course of the Republican. Uh, primary campaign, he was the only one of the Republican candidates making the, the principled case for withdrawal from Iraq, and of course, Congressman Paul was one of, I think, only five Republican congressmen to vote against the war resolution back in 2002. Um, and so he had a pretty strong case. You know, even Senator Obama was not in the Senate at the time, so he didn't actually have to cast a vote. It was pretty clear from the one speech that he gave in Chicago. Uh, before the war that he was opposed to it, and I think for the right reasons. But I think that that Ron Paul had an additional legitimacy to make this case uh, because he had actually voted against the war and spoken out against it and made a principled case for withdrawal uh, from the moment the war started. Um, And I think that, to some extent, he would be in an even stronger position to make that argument, but, but among the two major party candidates, I think Barack Obama clearly is in a stronger position to make that argument that the war in Iraq was a mistake at the outset, that clearly some of the mistakes that were made along the way exacerbated our problems there. But at the end of the day, uh, it was a, an extraordinarily ambitious undertaking and ultimately has undermined our security. And I think that that is something that Ron Paul did say during the course of the Republican primaries, and I think Barack Obama did as well to kind of to, to really advance this argument in the Democratic primaries that, that experience, which was was Hillary Clinton's strong suit, doesn't really get you that much if it doesn't lead to good judgment on the most for important foreign policy issue of the last seven or eight years. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the point there that's interesting, sort of what you would emphasize versus what, what I would emphasize, is that not only was the objective overambitious, but that it was based on flawed assumptions. So, right. um, but, you know, you, you asked me when we were prepping for this, um, you expressed some frustration about why Obama hadn't spent more time in the general election campaign right. as he did in the primary, talking about how the decision to go to war was a mistake and, and what was wrong with it. And, um, right. you know, he has, he, he hit it pretty hard in his um, acceptance speech at the, at the convention. Right. I, I went back and reminded myself after we talked. But um, the other piece of it, and this, it raises some questions, I think, about, um, about the ultimate um, sort of how, how big libertarianism could ever get as a, as a philosophy. But because the ultimately... I think the reason the Obama people have chosen not to spend more time on it is there's pretty clear signals from the American public that um, it doesn't really want to look back in that way. That the Democratic primary electorate was very eager, or a big, a big right. chunk of it was, to look back and focus on that and really um, spend some time affixing blame in a, in a clear way. But right. um, that the American public as a whole, I would argue, both likes to look forward, likes to always think that our best days are ahead of us and, and wants to be told that our best days are ahead of us when it's things aren't looking too good at the moment, right. and um, maybe doesn't have a great interest in um, the kind of self-introspection 
that I think the the critique you put forward, the critique Ron Paul puts forward, um, the right. critique that a lot of progressives also put forward, that um, that's just not ever been, and it's both the great strength and the great weakness of the American body politic, that that's not ever where where we are. So does that, um, does that inevitably keep libertarianism from growing out of its minor party niche as an ideology, or could, could you imagine a sort of libertarian version of the neoconservative project that eventually takes over one of the major parties? Well, that's, there are a lot of questions in there. First of all, I'm a, I'm a libertarian, but I'm also a historian. And so I, I, I agree with your argument that, that while books about history and biographies are extraordinarily popular, um, generally speaking, Americans do tend to look forward and not, not backward. Uh, they may not go, go quite as far as Henry Ford and say history is all bunk, but, you know, there is a kind of longstanding tradition of, of looking forward and not looking backward. But as a, as a historian who now is working in public policy and therefore plays with a lot of political scientists, um, how do you... Uh, make the, the case for a particular foreign policy project. You invoke history. You, history is your evidence. Just like physicists invoke, you know, gravity and quantum physics, uh, you know, policymakers, and particularly in foreign policy, invoke history. So what are the lessons from Iraq as they should be applied to U.S. intervention going forward? That's the key issue, and I think that's where judgment matters enormously. Um, and, you know, John McCain is very consistent on this point. He was certainly one of the leading advocates for war in Iraq, not just, again, a critic of the way the Bush administration conducted it, but he was making the argument that, the like, that there was not a great likelihood of a civil war in Iraq because there was no evidence of Sunni and Shia fighting with one another. He was the one making the argument before the war that we would be greeted as liberators. You know, he was not, certainly not the only one, but he was a leading advocate for this war. What other lessons, how is that consistent with what John McCain has advanced in the past? Well, again, John McCain was one of the leading advocates for military intervention in Kosovo, both with ground troops and with air power, as was actually used. And I think that's consistent with, a, with his thinking, that he believes very strongly that the use of American military power advances U.S. national security across a broad front and also ultimately uh, advances uh, you know, the security of the globe. I think there's a, there are very real quest, reasons to question that, and I think that, that Iraq is certainly the best uh, case to question that because it's not just a function of the bad decisions that were made along the way but that, that, that nation building, regime change followed by nation building is an extraordinarily ambitious undertaking. Even in a country like Afghanistan, I mean, I, always, I, I often ask myself, if there had been no war in Iraq, would there be an Afghanistan syndrome? We, there clearly is an Iraq syndrome. But would there be an Afghanistan syndrome after fighting in Afghanistan for many years? And, and sadly, you know, we've seen that effort kind of slip backward over the last two or three years. I don't know that there would be to the same extent because I do think Americans still believe in using our power to advance in our national security and they would continue to support the war in Afghanistan because that war was specifically directed at that, that object. Once the rationales for the war against Iraq had fallen away, particularly the national security rationale, the, the argument that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction and would use them, which was never, the, the latter part was never very plausible, but even the, the former, that he had weapons of mass destruction, that's fallen away. Again, a majority of Americans believe that Saddam Hussein was connected to the events of 9-11. That also has fallen away. Even George Bush has backed away from suggesting that. Um, and once those, the connection between the war in Iraq and U.S. national security fell apart, and people saw that it was undermining American security rather than advancing it, then that's where I think you saw a lot of Americans kind of backing away. Now, that doesn't answer your other question, which is about libertarianism more generally, and I want to stress that Iraq is only one piece of a much bigger puzzle for me, and I think for most other libertarians, certainly most people here at Cato that I work with, um, but it is consistent with a bipartisan vision of the use of, US, uh, of the U.S. military in a fairly you know, aggressive, proactive way, believing that using that military will, on balance, advance U.S. national security, where I, as I generally think that's that's not the case, and that is a that is a broader critique of U.S. foreign policy. It goes beyond Iraq, goes beyond the Bush administration, and I think that's and and frankly, I think that a majority of Americans are coming around to that point of view that while they want a strong military, they want the United States to be engaged militarily and ec economically, they don't want the United States to be the world's policeman. That that piece of information comes through pretty clearly in, 
virtually every poll that I've seen well, in I the think, last five years. I think I now have to jump in and push back a little bit on the idea that it's a straight line from um, Kosovo to Iraq with Afghanistan in between. I, can't, I can't believe it took that long. Actually, <laughs> no. <know>. Well, I, <laughs> always get, I always get dinged by the commentators for being too polite and letting my interlocutor talk for too long. <laughs> and I'm, it's okay. particu- I'm particularly tempted today because I've got a sore throat, so I thought I'll just let him go on for a while. But, but look, the thing is, uh, although ironically they were, of course, much criticized for it, but the Clinton administration did invoke a rather limited concept of the use of force in Kosovo. And of course, McCain, although he did not, I believe, favor um, military intervention in Kosovo at the beginning, once he came around to it, he then favored using ground troops very aggressively, where the administration said, actually, no, that goes beyond what we think our interests are. And um, somewhat to everyone's surprise, they pulled that off. Um, Part of the reason, of course, that they pulled it off, that we pulled it off, I should say, since I was in at that time, was that um, there was, number one, a NATO-wide coalition that really was a NATO-wide coalition, and number two, there was an extensive use of diplomacy. And if you remember, um, Marti Atasari from Finland being the person who finally went and um, did the negotiations with the Russians and then Milosevic that brought the thing to a close. So there was both a more limited construct of military power and, number two, uh, a much broader construct of how military power fits with your other tools in the toolkit, if you pardon me for trotting out that cliché. Right. So that, um, you know, number one, you're going to be more effective in the world if you use a mix of tools. And number two, you have a at least a somewhat bounded idea of what military power can buy you. Now, what I do think... Right. And, and similarly, actually, the, the war in Afghanistan, um, you could say that it started off um, taking more advantage of allies and having um, at least a somewhat more bounded construct in terms of working quickly to create an Afghan government and turn power over to it and right. being very focused on what was a clear military objective, which was going right. after bin Laden, until we kind of forgot about going after bin Laden because of Iraq. And, and so the, the, the hypothetical about Afghanistan is... It's hard to think about because, of course, if there hadn't been an Iraq war, we might have gotten bin Laden by now, which Perhaps. on the one hand yes. would have been a very good thing for American yes. security and for the, the fate of Afghanistan. On the other hand, after getting bin Laden, if you continue to have trouble in Afghanistan, which you might very well because it's it's not a place that has ever held together very successfully, right. um, then you might very well have sort of a similar situation with Americans saying, well, remind me what we're doing there again. So right. that's kind of a, a funny a funny counterfactual because you you have to ask yourself, well, would we actually have done the big thing right and gotten Bin Laden if we hadn't pulled all the troops out to go to Iraq? I mean, as a, as a as a very long-standing and harsh critic of the decision to go to war with Iraq, I mean, I, I think there's no question that there was a diversion of attention and resources away from the fight in Afghanistan. But I'm not willing to to suggest or even posit that it, had we not gone into Iraq that we necessarily would have gotten Bin Laden. And you're not saying that either. I mean, the truth is, we, we've learned this the hard way, it actually is quite easy for a man, even a man who's you know quite tall and has other features that distinguish him from others, uh, to, to blend into a population, uh, you know, if he's in the tribal areas, that's a territory the size of Vermont. Um, you know, that's a pretty big area. Um, and so... Even had we not diverted attention, there's a, there's a chance that we would not have gotten him or Mullah Muhammad Omar or Zawahri or others, and, and where would we be? I also think, I mean, we're getting off the subject a little bit, although I guess we didn't really have that strict an agenda. I mean, I think that, that talking too much about bin Laden misses the extent to which al-Qaeda has t- transitioned uh, away a little bit from a from a central organizing structure to more of an ideology and idea, and you see a lot of self starters in in Western Europe and elsewhere whose connection to Al Qaeda is extremely tenuous. Um, perhaps have never had any connection whatsoever to Al Qaeda Central. So I think, you know, we do have a different problem on our hands today. I agree with you completely. Had we captured Bin Laden and others or killed them, uh, that we'd be in a better place. Uh, but I think that our problems today are much are much broader than that. Obviously, the, um, the terrorism experts draw it as three concentric circles with um, Bin Laden and his central. Mm-hmm. Um, right. at the center, and then a group of affiliated organizations, and then the self-starters. And if you right. if you imagine a, a scenario where um, we'd either actually gotten bin Laden or at the very least made it considerably harder for him to reconstitute um, what some of the experts refer to as al-Qaeda central and harder to reestablish contacts and ongoing relationships with the second tier of organizations, then... 
you would have sort of a hollow donut rather than this tripartite right. structure. And so um, it seems to me, um, and I also think it's unfortunate, while bin Laden does matter, it's also unfortunate to over emphasize him and, and right. make him into yes. more of a symbol than he in fact is. Correct. So, so you know, that I see as, as would have been a danger if we'd spent the past six years doing nothing but looking for bin Laden. But so right. I still, I think we basically it's hard to see how we could have yeah. been worse off, I have to say. Well, I mean, that's a very good point. Um, you know, I focus a lot of attention in talking about Iraq about the resources that we've invested in that particular project and how might some, even just some of those resources have been invested elsewhere in the fight against Al-Qaeda and other uh, affiliated terrorist groups. Um, I think that $700 billion would buy you an awful lot of counterterrorism uh, effort. In fact, it would be, you know, it would be like killing a fly with a sledgehammer, frankly. You don't need nearly that much. And, you know, it's not just that the, that the war in Iraq has been a distraction and a diversion of resources. It's, it clearly has made our problem worse. I mean, the, 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 the standing of the United States is at such a low point, largely because of the war in Iraq and because the rationales that were put forward for going to war in the first place have been proved, uh, you know, just completely untenable. And so, you know, the, it's, a, it's a combination of uh, counterproductive and, uh, and a distraction, and it's just, it, I think it clearly has undermined our security over the last six, seven years. Well, the logical next place this conversation goes is Pakistan, I think, which is, which yes. is also um, likely to be a topic of some interest in debates. And um, there I think you can, you can make the argument that in addition to um, how good it would have been to have some of the money you just mentioned um, be spent in the, uh, the frontier provinces, um, you, you maybe even more fundamentally than the money, because of course we have given, we did give Musharraf a lot of money over the last seven years, we just don't right. seem to have been very careful about what he did with it, uh, right. to the end result that um, you don't have, you have neither hard progress against terrorists nor soft progress in terms of changing the social conditions that make it so easy for, for terrorists to, to hide out in, in those Right. In those regions, but but even more than the money, you, you we seem to have had no coherent Pakistan strategy other than just a, a sort of well, let's support Musharraf and cross our fingers right. strategy, and and so that that to me is the most really the most damning thing that you can say about the Iraq project is that it, it so totally distracted us from everything that we we ought to have been able to understand was was important, and that we were left, right. you know, when democracy actually broke out in Pakistan, we were left scratching our heads, and we're now in this right. crazy situation where, you know, Al Qaeda is shooting at us, and the Pakistani government is shooting at us, right. and that right. seems like a sort of again, it's hard to imagine how you could be in a much worse fix, although. Um, I suppose the way you could be in a much worse fix is if someone who shouldn't gets hold of the Pakistani nuclear weapons. Right. Uh, yeah, it is possible to spin out an even worse scenario, and it usually starts with Pakistani nuclear weapons in the hands of somebody we don't mm -hmm. want to have them. So, so that you know, that's that's everyone's nightmare scenario. I don't I don't think there's any disagreement there. Um, you know, I often wonder how different would U.S.-Pakistan relations and and our policy towards Pakistan have been under a President Gore or a President Kerry. Um, because the, the simple fact is, in Pakistan, we did not have a lot of good options. Uh, part of that was our own fault, of course, because we invested so much attention and effort on on the military, on Musharraf himself. We saw him as reliable. We saw him as stable. Uh, we weren't sure about some of the, some of the more democratic-leaning uh, uh, leaders there. And, you know, they're not, none of them are, are uh, uh, you know, without without questions about their background, of course. Um, you know, the, the situation is so tenuous. My colleague, Malou Anissa, had just returned from Pakistan. She was there for three weeks. She stayed in the Marriott Hotel that was just blown up. Uh, every day she was there, I was scared to death. I didn't tell her that, of course, while she was there, because that would make her more nervous. She came back with so many stories. Um, but she came back with, you know, She'd been working on this project for a long time and realizing just how complicated it is. We're talking about a country that has never had formal control over the tribal areas ever. Uh, what do we, the United States, what does the Pakistani government, what does the Afghan government do about a, an area that borders Afghanistan that is under no positive government control? Uh, what do you do when the Pakistani military, uh, at least elements within that military, seem to be uh, siding with the Taliban elements? Even reports, as you note, 
of Pakistani troops firing on American troops. I mean, this is a, this is close to a disaster. Now, I was I was cautiously I was very cautiously optimistic about a story in today's Post. Ann Scott Tyson wrote a story, a very short story about possible Afghan Pakistan U.S. cooperation. To, uh, and that was a new thing. I had not seen that before. I hope that that gets more attention over the next couple of days. But at the end of the day, this is not just our fight. It is not primarily our fight. This is a fight for the Afghan government, for them to be able to assert control over their territory, and that means no safe haven for, for insurgents and Taliban elements. This is a fight for Pakistan. This is a group of people that does not uh, uh, agree or wish to follow the dictates of Islamabad, that cannot hold. That is not a suitable situation for the Pakistani government. What are they prepared to do? As it stands right now, tragically, they are, they are interpreting, many Pakistanis are interpreting this not as their fight, but, but as our fight. And whenever a Pakistani official, a government official, a military official uh, makes noises about fighting the Taliban or fighting the insurgents, they're seen as doing our bidding. That is just a complete failure in our communication and, and in their ability to communicate the interests at stake here. And I think, you know, that that's just, if we can't get off that dime, then, then we're just we're just in a, in a in a in deep deep trouble. Now I agree with you on the problem. I wonder whether we have the same solution or not. Because my view on Pakistan, in, in particular, is that it's the things that Pakistan thinks are its fight are are pretty. You know, the Pakistani government thinks are pretty clear. And one of the reasons that you have these elements in the Pakistani military that are in contact with every every unholy actor in that part of the world you could name is that mm -hmm. Pakistan views its primary fight as with India. Right. And so the way in the long run that you can get the Pakistani government to be more interested in other things that are going on around it is, in my view, to show that you're more interested in helping Pakistan and India move forward on things like Kashmir. Mm -hmm. um, and where you have an administration that let itself get totally distracted and you know was sort of pursuing civilian nuclear cooperation with India on the one hand and trying to pressure the Pakistanis to do more with terrorism on the other hand and apparently never thinking about how these two things might or might not be be related in the in the Pakistani mind and, and I suspect you could come up with half a dozen other examples of, of policies that we undertook without really understanding how they how they related in the in the minds of our of our um, hoped for allies so that um, where I think where I think you and I diverge is that in my view in order to get better results on this core security interest that we have of um, rooting out terrorists who can threaten us directly right. um, you know again not even talking about secondary and tertiary ones just thinking purely about the people that we know are trying to, to hurt us right. um, to do that you actually have to be more involved with these other societies, not less. And so this is one where saying, oh, they have to make it their fight um, doesn't work. You have to figure out, okay, what can we do on their fights to get them to see their fight as, as our fight? Am, am I right that we diverge a bit there? A little bit, because I, I struggle, frankly, and it's not unique to counterterrorism, but mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is what we're talking about. How do we make it their fight by becoming more involved in their fight. I, I mean, I know this is an extremely complicated issue, and I'm not, I'm not trying to oversimplify it. But, you know, there, there's a related issue with respect to capacity building. You hear people talk about capacity building all the time, is that the problem is weak governance, and we need to come up with ways to help other, other uh, governments, you know, establish uh, control and security over their, over their territory. Uh, there is a very, very fine line, however, between capacity building and capacity destroying, mm -hmm. because the more you do for them, the less they are willing to do for themselves, for perfectly, perfectly logical reasons. I mean, this is, I mean, if I were in their position, I'd do the same thing. I think this is more psychological, and I think it is trying to understand, frankly, why they do not see it as their fight. Maybe they see something that we really don't. Maybe they understand something that we don't. Maybe they... Yeah, maybe they're right. I'm just putting this on the table. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying whether this is accurate or not. Maybe they're right that their greater security concern is with respect to India. I don't know, but we, but your point is it, the, the the bottom line point is a good one. Is that because the, the Bush administration became so distracted by a lot of other issues that had nothing whatsoever to do with 9/11, they gave short shrift to these deeper questions about 
you know, cooperating with Pakistan, thinking that you could do it while at the same time negotiating a nuclear deal with the Indians. I mean, the, all, those, all of those points, I think we don't really disagree that much. It really comes down to what specifically would a, a President Gore or a President Kerry have done in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and with respect to India that would have put us in a stronger position today than where we are. I think that it that, that focuses too much on what the U.S. government should and can do and not enough on what a lot of other NGOs that have no specific connection to the government are and can do. And those kind of, those kind of efforts have, you know, don't have the same kind of, aren't held in the same bad odor, frankly, as when the U.S. government is doing it and when you have a, you know, U.S. government officials or military personnel uh, conducting these operations uh, or conducting these negotiations as opposed to, you know, a lot of other people doing good work in these countries that are not doing it at the behest of the, of the U.S. government. I think those kinds of efforts um, also have the potential, frankly, have the potential to, to pay even deep, even better dividends than, than U.S. government action. Well, a way of reframing that, then, is to say, what is it that a President Gore or a President Kerry or a President Obama, for that matter, wouldn't have done? Right. Um, and I, there, I do think you could make a list of things, uh, starting with the blank check military aid to the Musharraf government, which just conveyed so clearly to Pakistani government, but more important to Pakistani society, what we did care about and what we didn't care about. Right. Um, right. So that's one thing. I think um, pulling pulling the special forces that were looking for, for bin Laden and Mullah Omar and the Taliban leadership out to go to Iraq, which, which again clearly communicated what we were and weren't really, right. or you know, miscommunicated, right. to my point of view, what our long term, what our deep long term interests really were. Um, and this, um, this, I, I'm honest enough to admit that this next one is a bigger problem than just partisanship. But um, a smarter drug control and eradication policy sure would help. <laughs> You're not going to get any disagreement from the from me on that, Heather. I mean, Cato Cato published a paper several years ago, um, you know, making the case that you cannot fight the so-called war on terror. I don't like to call it the war on terror anymore, as most terrorism experts don't like to call it the war on terror. But you cannot right. fight the war on terror and the war on drugs at the same time in Afghanistan. You have to choose. And it was extraordinarily short-sighted and I think naive to think that we could. Uh, advance a policy that is going to completely uh, undermine what minimal chance the Afghan people have in the short term of providing for themselves uh, while at the same time expecting them to support us in our fight against the Taliban. Um, I think that was extraordinarily short-sighted. I think there are smart people who knew that all along, but again, this is a place where ideology gets in the way. And, and this is not a partisan issue because you don't hear a lot of Democrats either making the case uh, frankly, for looking the other way on, on opium cop cultivation. Yeah, and I wouldn't uh, even so much time. advocate looking the other way. Um, you know, Rand Beers, who I work with at National Security right. Network, and yes. who spent um, yeah, most of the 90s in the trenches on the um, quote-unquote drug wars in Latin America, says right. that um, what we really know about this, although it's very politically unpopular, is that you start with alternative livelihoods and you bring in alternative livelihoods and for the first several years you say nothing about eradication you say here's something right. else that you can do and you build those up and you make it clear when you you wait until it's clear to the community that you can actually make a living do the doing the alternative thing whatever it is and then you start over a couple of years um, you start a voluntary eradication program and then you say okay next year the voluntary eradication program is going to become mandatory and then the mandatory year, you say, okay, if it's not gone next year, we're sending in troops to get rid of whatever's left. But that you start with, here's something else you can do, and you actually try to work it from that end, and that it wor that works much better than if you start right. from the... But that's um, bipartisan political suicide, I think. Um, right. Well, I, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, I think this is one area where uh, if, you, if you spend any time studying, the, you know, the facts, it would, it, it leads in a particular direction, and it always puzzles me when uh, the facts lead one way, and yet there's bipartisanship leading in the other way. I just kind of, I don't really understand how that works in a, in a, in a functioning uh, market, market of ideas. Um, I'll just say, uh, in terms of crop substitution strategies combined with crop eradication, you know, the, the, the effort in Latin America hasn't been a shining success either, because what you see is a lot, of, a, a lot of movement of cultivation, but not a net reduction in the total amount yeah. of coca production in the case of Latin America. One other quick point is I, 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 have, I have my own skepticism about crop substitution. It hasn't tended to work on, on, on the whole, 
But, of course, it is even harder to make the case that growing things other than, than uh, narcotics uh, will, will lead to prosperity for people when we, the United States, and other Western governments in Japan have a systematic policy of, of undermining uh, the ability of uh, you know, developing countries to, to uh, profit from agriculture because of the way we, we, we subsidize and distort uh, the agriculture market. Again, this is a bipartisan problem. Uh, you, hear, you hear sensible people on both sides argue that, that our farm programs are harmful. I've made the case, my colleagues here have made the case, that it's not just economically uh, backward, but it also harms our foreign policy because on the one hand we're seen as advocating free trade, on the other hand we're seen as advancing policies that, that actually undermine the ability of these folks to actually make a living. And I think it's, uh, ex again, extraordinarily short-sighted. Now here I'm going to jump in and make a progressive point, and um, this is another one that um, I'll be interested to see whether this comes up in the in the debate, I, I rather doubt that it will. But um, but you know because as you say it's such a the problem is bipartisan. But but you never know. And um, you know from my point of view the underlying problem on well there, on agriculture has its own um, particularities in the American political system as it does in the Japanese and, and others. But but the underlying problem is that you don't have any confidence on the domestic side that the government can or will do anything to compensate people who were genuinely hurt on the domestic end or that the government can or will actually um, make the playing field level on the on the domestic side so that you have um, you have constituencies um, and farmers are one and uh, unions are another both on the service sector and in the dwindling industrial sector where um, you know people are not Unsusceptible to the argument that both from a security perspective and from a, a moral perspective, it would be good if farmers in West Africa weren't starving because of our commodity prices and if um, factory workers in Pakistan were able to export shirts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then those folks turn around and say, okay, well, so you promise us trade adjustment programs and they're tiny and they're ineffective and our communities are decimated and we're, you know, 55-year-old auto workers can't really go retrain and have a successful career at McDonald's that allows them to put their kids through college. So right. to solve the problem that you quite rightly identify, you're actually desperately in need of a, of a real old-fashioned progressive solution where the government is actually the mediator that, that does a little bit of... Um, I've just walked right up to a word I don't want to use, and I'm trying to think my way around it quickly. Um, and I, I think Please, you can, excuse me. I think you can guess what it is. Um, that the government is a little bit of a mediator smoothing over um, losses so that um, the gainers gain and the losers don't lose as much as they perceive right now that they, they would lose. And that we've, we've gotten ourselves politically into a terrible hole where... Um, the losing constituencies just don't believe there's anything in trade for them. And I think whoever's our next president, this is just going to pose us a terrible political problem. Heather, Heather, you've walked yourself, you've walked yourself into a corner. Uh, you, you, what you're talking about is making sure the winners can win and the losers can't lose sounds an awful lot like Hank Paulson's bailout plan. Uh, <laughs> look, I, I mean, when you talk about... Uh, protecting workers, you're talking about, and we'll just, let, let's confine it, I mean, I introduced this, this discussion, and you know, I'll, I'll say very clearly that I, I believe in free trade, most libertarians believe in free trade, that's one of our core beliefs, that we believe that people should be able to sell, buy and sell goods freely on an open market, globally, okay, and, and, and that, that should not be encumbered by government. Um, I do believe that it's particularly problematic from a security perspective with respect to agriculture because you're talking about particularly uh, you know, poor people who are dependent upon agriculture for their livelihood. And the sum total, I mean, my favorite statistic, the sum total of foreign aid that we give every year to, to, to sub-Saharan Africa is less than the effect of our, yep. our uh, market-distorting policies in agriculture. So let's just stick to agriculture. When you talk about protecting the incomes of Growers in the United States, and of course, most products are not subsidized. Uh, but you know, there are a few that, that are heavily subsidized, or other or other quotas and whatnot to restrict competition. When you when you when the government makes a point of of working on their behalf to try to 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 increase their incomes, they necessarily work at cross purposes for the interests of others inside of the United States. I'm talking about the 98 point something of us who are not growers but who are food consumers. And all of the market distorting policies that we have 
raise the cost of food for the for those of us who who primarily eat and don't produce food. So whenever government gets involved, and, and this is where I bring Hank Paulson back into the discussion, whenever whenever government gets involved and says we cannot let these people lose from from competition, from bad bad investments, whatever the case may be, they are necessarily saying we are we are choosing to to help these people at the expense of others. And and that's where policy, I mean this you know, that's where public policy in a domestic context, even in and it sometimes works in a foreign policy context as well, is is about picking and choosing winners and losers, which is based not, I submit, on on Need as as uh, you know neatly characterized in a, in a political science textbook, but on political power. Now, and I, that's what I we saw. I completely you know. agree with you in one sense, and completely disagree with you in another. In the sense that that I actually agree with what you just said, is if if we can acknowledge that this is first and foremost a political conversation, that there is in yes. fact no free trade in the textbook sense practiced you know hard anywhere in the yes. world, really. Yes. So we're actually not. And I, 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 a big part of the problem with the debate actually is that we debate as if what we were practicing, or, or even what anybody was advocating, right. except um, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll exempt the Cato Institute from this. But <laughs> right, the, the salient political forces in our trade debate and in the global trade debate, nobody's advocating actual free trade, except, except for free, except for the right. Cato Institute. But so as law, and um, you know, since nobody's nobody's going to appoint you guys to replace Hank Paulson anytime soon. Um, Unfortunately, no. <laughs> so, Certainly not me. You don't want me doing that job. Yeah. So as long as what you're in fact talking about is different kinds and different degrees of managed trade and trade managed to different ends and trade managed, I'll agree with you, to different degrees of, um, of efficacy, then I think you next have to ask the question, both morally and strategically, who are you benefiting or who are you hurting the most? Right. And you and I are both making the argument that globally trade needs to be adjusted to hurt some people less or advantage them more um, because that would be in our core security interest um, regardless right. of our views on how free trade should ever be. But what I'm Where saying, differ, right. what I'm saying well, is from a political point of view, if you want to get to the point where you can advantage the people overseas that you want to advantage, you have to find some way of changing... Um, both the public perception of who's advantaged and disadvantaged at home, and I would argue uh, the reality of who feels advantage, who's advantaged and disadvantaged at home, and that's a purely sort of pragmatic set of calculations that has very little to do to do with the economic theory of free trade. Um, a fair point. I mean, two two quick things. Then, I mean, I'm in the education business, even though I'm not a teacher. Okay, I work for an educational institution. That's what we do, and so we try in all the things that we do here to make the case for good public policy based on our principles. Okay, and one of those core principles is free trade. And I will admit to you, you know, candidly, that it is sometimes a hard sell because people think of themselves. Sometimes they think of themselves as consumers. Other times, they t other times they think of themselves as producers when in, what they should be thinking them of themselves is as people who do a job for a reason, which is to be able to provide for their family and advance their own economic security. On balance, are they helped or hurt by trade with, with, with people who sell products, you know, the, the best possible product at the lowest possible price? On balance. Even people who are heavily, you know, who, who are heavily invested personally in the manufacturing trades, on balance, are they more helped or hurt by by trade? I think the evidence shows pretty clearly that they're helped by trade. Um, sometime um, maybe you'll travel with me to the state of Michigan, and we'll have some fun um, trying to make that argument to some folks. But um, I want to make sure, do that. If, if you don't mind me brutally wrenching this discussion in another direction, I want to make sure we have time brutally. to talk about Russia and Georgia because I think that is something that will that will sure. come up at the debate, and um, it's a uh, you know, so so today um, we have Secretary Rice in Ukraine promising the Ukrainians that they that the U.S. will continue to be their strongest advocate for NATO membership, whether the Ukrainians want into NATO or not, which seems, seems right. rather which is a big issue. Clear, yes. yes. uh, to put it mildly. So, um, yeah. you know, you you have this this political dynamic where you have um, Senator McCain who rushed way out ahead of the Bush administration to proclaim that we are all Georgians and um, right. Governor Palin who kind of nonchalantly says, yeah, we might have to go to war with Russia if Georgia were in NATO. Right. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you have a complete consensus across the 
American foreign policy establishment, um, or at least its Democratic and Republican avatars, that uh, yes. that um, support for Georgia and Ukraine um, membership action plans should be continued. And just from a again a very pragmatic sense, it's hard to see where walking away from it at this point would do anybody any good. So. Um, Oh, I disagree. So if you, if you were the libertarian presidential candidate up on stage on Friday, what would you right. say about this? I think that it that you really need to focus on the nonchalance, not just of, of uh, Governor Palin, but also of Senator McCain. Uh, what exactly does he expect to accomplish by extending security guarantees to Georgia? Now... Uh, I think we have to start by recognizing that while we did not have a formal security guarantee to Mr. Saakashvili prior to his intervention in, in South Ossetia, which then prompted the Russian response, uh, that he believed that he would be supported at least by the United States, if not by other Western European countries, even without a membership action plan, even without formal membership in NATO. Okay, This is the moral hazard that applies to all alliances. To what extent do you encourage reckless and risky behavior on the part of the members of the alliance. They now, are I, I just have to stop you and say that it's very possible to have well-functioning alliances where people aren't goaded into reckless behavior in the way that Mr. Saakashvili seems to have been. It is possible in a, in a political science textbook. Just like free trade is oh, possible. Oh, come on. The Estonians, Heather. Latvians, and Lithuanians have been very sensible um, for the last 20 years. I mean... Uh, and actually, after the after the, the Russians, uh, after a cyber attack attributed to Russia was, uh, you know, uh, uh, accounted for, uh, you know, essentially shutting down uh, Estonia's mar- uh, computer network for a period of time, the question was, wait a minute, we're members of NATO. What is NATO going to do about this? To which I reply, yeah, what is NATO going to do about this? What exactly exactly are the member states of NATO going to do about an attack on one of these new members that is on the border of Russia? What exactly are we going to do? Now, look, I'm going to, I'm going to try to put the best case I possibly can for NATO, for NATO expansion, which is the belief, the confidence, frankly, that by extending security guarantees to these states on the border on the borders of Russia, that that will deter Russian aggression right. against them. Right. Okay, and then I say, what if it doesn't work? Because of course France and France and, and Great Britain extended security guarantees to Poland in 1938, and that didn't really work either. So what exactly are we expecting is going to happen? Do we believe that we have interests that are at least as important to us? as the interests that are at stake in South Ossetia and Abkhazia right now. Yes or no? Are our interests directly engaged there? What are the American people prepared to do to defend Georgia's continued control over those two provinces? What are we prepared to do? That's the crux of the issue. Both Senator McCain and Senator Obama have to make clear that by advancing, if, if, and because they really don't disagree that much on this point, they believe that Georgia and Ukraine should be members of NATO, although, as you point out, Ukraine isn't even clear that they want to be a member of NATO. Georgia clearly does. The Georgians, you know, the, the polling data is pretty clear. They want to be members of NATO. To what end? What are we prepared to do? Are we prepared to admit them in NATO and then say that they are members of NATO and South Ossetia and Abkhazia are indisputably Georgian territory and we and all the other members of NATO will fight to defend that principle. Is that what we're saying? I mean, I think those kinds of very kind of nuts and bolts questions need to be put on the table sooner rather than later. And those are exactly the kinds of discussions that we did not have, frankly. Cato tried to raise these issues in the late 1990s in the first two rounds of NATO expansion because there are a whole host of other issues that are similar to that. What are we going to do in the case of of a Russian military incursion into Latvia? What are we going to do? What are we going to do in the case of a cyber attack? What are we going to do since we raised this issue about NATO expansion, if we believe that expanding NATO makes the, makes the institution stronger and therefore advances our security, what are we going to do when our NATO members invoke Article 5 for the first time after 9-11 and then spend the next six years debating amongst themselves whether or not their troops should actually be put in harm's way in Afghanistan? What exactly do we the United States, what exactly do Americans get out of this alliance? If the one time, the only time in its history when Article 5 is invoked, it proves more troublesome than it's worth. Well, I think on both that question and the Russia question, um, there's there was an assumption of American stewardship that was completely misplaced. And in the... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Heather. I misunderstood. 
To whom? By yeah, whom? I'll, I'll get there. Just a sec. Okay. So in the case of, um, I mean, take the Baltics. That seems like the clearest example to me. That the idea, w- I mean, I think you, you framed exactly rightly uh, the, the principle behind it, which was that the fact of the fact of incorporating them into NATO would be of sufficient deterrent value that it would uh, take that military option off the table forever. Right. But the context in which that could have worked, and in the context in which, frankly, it, it did work um, up until this August, was a context in which your strategy toward NATO was also coupled with the strategy that said for security reasons, for energy reasons, for economic reasons, above all for, for Europe, which, as you said in other contexts, needs this more than we do, um, that your strategy of expanding NATO would be coupled with a strategy of building up your relationships with Russia and um, tying it more rather than less into into Western institutions. And there you had... Which we did not do. Which, right. which number one, we did not do. Uh, right. Which, number two, you then had a uh, president come to power in Russia, in Putin, who said, um, okay, the breakup of the Soviet Union was the greatest uh, geopolitical tragedy of the last hundred years. Right. Um, Russians feel this burning sense of shame and anger from how the West has, they perceive, treated them since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I am going to retain and expand my power by making it my business to redress that in every way I can. You had a Bush administration, which uh, seems willfully to have misunderstood this development. Um, You had Europeans who who seem to have understood it better, but um, maybe also at the same time have been, have perceived that their national interests lay more in signing gas deals than anything else, um, in -hmm. the case of, say, the Italians and some others. And so you let a number of years go by where, you know, there was frankly a lot of inattention and the Russians correctly saw that there was a lot of inattention. Then you had the Bush administration continuing to shove, shove, shove on membership action plans for Georgia and Ukraine where, number one, it was clear the Europeans wouldn't buy it anymore. And number two, it wasn't clear that, you know, the Russians had been giving off signals for more than six months um, that they were getting rid- that they Absolutely. perceived Georgia as a problem and they were getting ready to do something about it. Right. And really got very little response from us. So you had, you had several opportunities to actually manage the process better and, and you, you failed to take them up on it. Similarly, um, with NATO and Article 5 after 9-11, um, where, and this this goes back to our previous discussion, where you know, yes, NATO invoked Article Five, um, and we turned right around and said, oh, we have to go into Afghanistan so fast, we can't really wait for you guys. And then after we go into Afghanistan, we're going to go into Iraq, and we're going to let you know very clearly that we don't really care what you think. So, um, right. two examples of really un, unsuccessful alliance management. And at this point, I think your fair rejoinder to me is, well, if the American government is so incompetent at managing its alliances, perhaps it shouldn't have them. <laughs> and and that, I have to say, um, after the last eight years... I, that you made that argument for me. Thanks. <laughs> I did, didn't I? Um, look, I believe... I mean, I think that there is a, there is a, a, a reasonable argument to be made for alliances from time to time. But I believe that allies should have capabilities that are, if not mutually beneficial, at least have the potential to contribute in a two-way direction. Oh, come on. You don't okay? appreciate all those Georgian troops in Iraq? No, I don't, as a matter of fact. Nor, frankly, do I, ma- do, do I, I don't appreciate the South Korean troops in Iraq who, who you know, whatever it was, 1,000 or 2,000 of them, meanwhile they're saying that they are capable of defending themselves against North Korean aggression, to which I say, you have a more serious problem on your hands. What are you doing in Iraq? Now I need to circle I mean, around and make a snarky political point, which is just to point out that um, something that is to be appreciated is the Canadian, Dutch, and Spanish troops in Afghanistan yes. who have been fighting and taking yes. casualties and who Senator Pay- McCain wants to repay by refusing to meet with the Prime Minister of Spain. I, I saw that. Um, you know, certainly there are exceptions to the case that I that I invoked about our our NATO allies not pulling their weight. The Canadians have disproport you know have suffered casualties disproportionate to the numbers of troops they have. Um, the Dutch, uh, uh, you know, I've certainly heard about that. The Aussies who aren't members of NATO are fighting in Afghanistan and, and doing you know fairly well from what I can understand. Um, but at the end of the day, if our allies lack the military capabilities to defend themselves, first and foremost, their primary mission, and to help us when we need it, we are partly to blame. Because in the, in the early 1990s, when there was a, a serious move in Europe 
towards some kind of European defense force. The United the U.S. position first, the first Bush administration, then the Clinton administration said, "You cannot move down that direction uh, at the expense of NATO capacity." And the Europeans said, "Well, we can't do both, so we're going to stick with NATO, and therefore." We are not going to have the capacity to do uh, a lot of out-of-area operations. And then, lo and behold, even though we're expanding NATO's mandate to include out-of-area operations, when the time comes and we need that military capacity, they lack the ability to do so. Again, I think that we Chris, are... Chris, I actually are, really think that's a misreading of what happened in the early 90s, where um, I, the overall dynamic, it seems to me, was that the Europeans were very keen on having peace dividends and were you know, interested in moving capacity, but above all were interested, or their legislatures and publics were interested in cutting capacity overall, so that it's, it's a little more as were ours. complicated. Right. As were ours. Yeah, that, is, that um, is also true. And, and you know, again, one of the stated objects of U.S. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War has been, only recently have we kind of backed away from this, but one of the stated rationales at the outset was to discourage our allies from de- from doing more to defend themselves because we feared, the, you know, the result, that we feared the effects of the uh, of, uh, either their greater independence from us or feared the effects of some kind of regional arms race, which I think is, you know, silly. That's especially with respect to Japan or, or and to a lesser extent in, in Europe. So. Yeah, I mean, I would argue that the turnaround in Europe began much earlier. Um, Japan Japan is its own strange situation. I'll, I'll buy that. Now, we said we were only going to talk for half an hour, and we have talked for an hour at this point, so perhaps, <laughs> perhaps we should okay. take pity on the audience and um, <laughs> promise them that we'll do this again sometime. Well, hopefully they'll want to have me back. Hopefully you'll want to have me back. Oh, absolutely. It was good talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.